Good morning, y'all. It's good to see everyone today. It is Easter Sunday, and we're certainly glad that you've joined us today. Today's obviously a different kind of Easter than we're normally accustomed to for a couple of reasons. One, we're still meeting online, and that's still something we're adjusting to and getting used to. But also, uh, for at least those of us at Farmington and many others in churches of Christ around the country. This is for a number of us the first Easter in years that we haven't spent at a Lads to Leaders convention. And so a number of things that are unique about today, but we're glad that we still have the opportunity to gather today to spend some time studying from God's Word to celebrate the resurrection. And we're certainly going to focus a lot more on the resurrection, our worship hour here in just a little bit. But this morning, as we continue in our study of Genesis, we arrive in Genesis, the 15th chapter. Genesis chapter 15 is in many regards one of the most significant chapters in the entire story of Abram or Abraham and God's selection of Abraham and his descendants to be his chosen people. In that regard, it really makes it one of the most significant points in the entire story of God and his efforts and his plan to redeem all mankind. And so as we enter chapter 15, we're coming off of the encounters that Abram had. We talked about last week with his nephew Lot. We saw how Lot is no longer in the picture. Chapter 14 ended with Abram having been victorious in battle rescuing Lot and the others from the city of Sodom who'd been taken as prisoners of war. And it ended with Abram being praised and blessed by Melchizedek, this king and priest who worshiped the same God of creation that Abraham did. And so this morning we turn our attention to chapter 15. And chapter 15 begins with these words. And the, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, look, you have given me no offspring. A member and a member of my household will be my heir. So chapter 15 opens here with God again reinforcing the blessing that he has already blessed Abram with. He's reinforcing the blessing that Melchizedek indicated to Abram in chapter 14. He promises Abram that I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. These words here, shield and reward, both of them are rather militaristic. It's in the context of chapter 14, where Abram's just come off of this major battle. When he talk, when God says, I will be a shield about you, I will be your shield, he's talking about it in the context of, I am going to protect you just the way I did. And your reward, remember, chapter 14 ended with Abram refusing the gifts, refusing to take the spoils of war after he was victorious and, secure, and that the king of Sodom was offering to him. But God says, don't worry, Abram, I am going to give you a reward and it shall be very great. But notice what Abram says there. He says, God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. If we think back to Genesis chapter 12 that we talked about two weeks ago, at the core of that promise to God, promise from God to Abram, was a promise to make him the father of many nations. It's a promise that we saw repeated last week. And yet, in all of this, Abram's at that point where he's wondering how long this will continue. God has made him a promise, but it doesn't look like anything is happening. 
In fact, Abram is so up is at the point where he says, the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Eleazar of Damascus was one of Abram's slaves, one of his servants. Now, as we talked about last time, it seemed that Lot was going to be the heir. And in the ancient Near Eastern world, childlessness was a major, a major concern. It was not uncommon for someone who was childless to adopt a member of their family to be the heir. And it certainly indicated, as we saw last week, that Abram was intending to adopt Lot, to make Lot his heir. But yet... Lot chose to go settle in the land of Sodom to move to the east to further himself from God and separate himself from his uncle. So now Abram didn't even have a family member to adopt. And while that may have been a common practice in the ancient Near Eastern world, leaving a slave, a member, a, a, a servant... A member of your household, yes, but not family. Leaving a slave as your heir was very unusual. And Abram in this moment expresses his frustration to God. Have you ever been there? I'm sure you have. We all have. We're praying and praying and praying and we know that God is faithful and we know that God will do something, but we can't help but wonder, God, where are you in this? When are you going to do it? God, you said you'd never forsake me, so why do I feel so alone? God, you said that you would provide good gifts. You said that you would take care of us if I trust in you, but God, where are you now? How long am I going to have to wait? We understand this feeling of Abram very well. Two weeks ago when we first looked at the call of Abram, one of the things we talked about was the relatability we have. That in reality, Abram is far more like us than sometimes we think. And I think this is one of those moments. One of those moments where we are reminded of what it looks like and what it means to be waiting on the promise of God and feeling like God is nowhere to be found. But God doesn't leave Abram in the pit of his despair. Notice what God says there in verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. God says, Abram, I hear you, but I have not forgotten you. You don't need to worry about making a slave your heir. I'm not going to bless you through a slave, Abram. I promise to make you the father of many nations, and I intend to do so. You're not going to have to worry anymore about who your heir is because I'm going to give you a son, your very own son. God ties this promise to Abram's flesh and blood. And he says, you are going to be blessed. From there in verse 5, he told him to go outside and look toward the heavens. In many ways, this is God answering Abram. In verse 3, depending on the way your Bible translates it, it may say, Behold, you have given me no offspring or look. But it's the, the same idea here. The word be translated behold in verse 3 can also be translated as look. And so here we have Abram saying, Look, God, you haven't given me a child, but you've promised me this. How much longer am I going to have to wait? What are you really actually going to give me here? And to Abram's look, God responds with a look of his own. He says, look to the heavens and count the stars if you can. God knew he couldn't. And he says, that is how prosperous I will make you. And so it's in this context then that we come to verse 6. Verse 6 might be one of the most significant verses in the entire Old Testament. And really in the entire 
story of Scripture. In verse 6, we read these words, And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and he, and he God, counted it to him as righteousness. He believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. When it says here that Abram believed God, what it literally means is God, Abram placed his complete trust and confidence in God. He placed his full assurance and hope in the God who had led him this far. And when he put his full and undoubting trust in God, believing fully and deeply believing. It says God counted it to him as righteousness. The idea here is that of kind of a banking metaphor. In this text, we see that God counts it to Abram. He puts it on his account. He credits it to the account. In in our bank accounts, we're all, in our spiritual bank accounts, we're all in the red. We're all people who are not righteous. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, according to Paul in Romans chapter 3. We know that we on our own cannot be righteous, none of us are good. But God credits, it, credits our faith to our account. Abram here was in the red spiritually, but God puts that deposit in his account, and he's in the black. He looks at the account, and God credits it to him. He counts it to him as righteousness. The same way that a bank teller would credit a deposit to our account. This text is going to, this verse here in, in, in Genesis 15, 6 is going to show up time and time again in Scripture. Paul's going to reference it in Romans chapter 4 and verse 8, where he's talking about Abram as the great example of faith. The Hebrew writer is going to talk about it in Hebrews 11 and verse 8 when he's talking about Abram in that great list of characters of faith. James is going to talk about it in James 2 and verse 21 when he too is talking about the relationship between faith and works. Time and time again, what we see throughout Scripture is that what justified Abram and made him righteous was his faith. His confident trust in the God of creation. And because Abram put his faith and trust fully and totally in God, God counted it to him as righteousness. Well, from there, we find an elaborate ritual. The, the story of an elaborate ritual that takes place between Abram and God. There in verse 7, God says to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. God again comes back from this first promise and moves back into the other. I'm going to give you a land. God continues to reassure Abram of his promises. And so, Abram follows that with this question. Oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? To some, this might seem like a question of doubt. That Abram, after he's just been counted righteous for his faith, here is saying, well, God, I don't believe you. Give me some kind of evidence. But it's not actually that at all. In fact, what we're going to see from in verses 9 through 18 is that God in this ritual that is performed is really just using 
a common practice in the ancient Near Eastern world to signify the promise and the relationship that's being made. God asks him there in verse 9 to bring him a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And Abram does that, and he brought them all, and he cut them in half, and he laid each half over against the other. And so Abram... This is strange, I know, because it doesn't seem like the kind of thing we do. God tells him to bring all these animals and every one of them but the birds. Abram cuts in half and set, lays them on the ground next to each other. And the vultures and the birds of prey come down on the carcasses and Abram has to drive them away. But after Abram has done this, as the sun was going down, Abram fell asleep. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. But here in verse 13, he says, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. This is a strange ritual to us. But this was the common practice in the ancient Near Eastern world of cutting an animal in half. It was literally a, sim a symbolic way of signifying that the promise being made between the two was so significant that they were pledging death if it were to be broken. In this regard, God then speaks to Abram in this silence. And He tells him something kind of strange. He tells Abram, it's going to be four hundred years before your children, your descendants actually get this land. Imagine how Abram must have felt hearing this. Wondering why God would tell him this now. And it does seem a little strange maybe that God does tell him this. But I think this detail is important. At the end of verse 16 there, we read God, God explains this 400-year interval by telling, them that the, by telling Abram that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It reminds us that God is still the God of the nations. We talked at length about that several weeks ago when we were looking at Genesis 10 and 11. But sometimes once we get to Abram in chapter 12, we can kind of become distracted and lose sight of the reality that God still cares for all people. Yes, God was going to fulfill His promise to Abram to give him the land. But before He did that, He wanted to give the people who were already there time to repent. He wanted to give them time to make it right because God values them as well. The Lord is not slow concerning His promises as some consider slowness, but is patient, not willing for any to perish. God is a God of mercy and a God of grace. And while He is also a God of justice, and a God whose righteousness cannot tolerate sin. God wasn't done waiting on the people of the Amorites to repent. He was going to give them time. Why might God... Why might God tell Abram here that he was going to that it was going to be 400 years before his children and his descendants would inherit the land that God was promising to him. To reassure Abram that even if it looked like it wasn't going to happen, it was. And to further drive home the reality that God cares 
for all the nations and all the people. That He is indeed a God of mercy and grace. Well, from there, in verse 17, when the sun had gone down, we see that it was dark, and behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. In the context of this passage and this ritual, when the two parties walked between the halves of the animals that had been cut and laid aside, when the two parties walk through this, they are pledging their lives on this promise. This is something we still kind of do from time to time. When you go to when you go to testify in a courtroom, I swear to tell the whole truth, n- nothing but the truth. So help me God. The idea of putting the so help me God on there is essentially saying that and if I don't tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, then God punish me for it. Some of you may have heard the phrase, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Again, a way of essentially saying, albeit not generally in a real and serious way, but essentially still saying, if I ain't telling the truth here, you might as well go and kill me. We still, in many, in many ways, make oaths like this. We say things that we attribute our truthfulness, where we tie our truthfulness to our very life. But here in this moment, God and Abram make a promise. And verse 18 tells us that that wasn't just any promise. It was a covenant. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land. And he goes on to describe the contours of it. But God and Abram make a covenant. When we talk about the story of God's people, this is a turning point moment in Genesis 15 because this is where the covenant is made. God says, Abram, I will take the death if I am not faithful to your pro- to this promise. God reassures Abram and promises th- in the strongest way possible with this covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two parties in which both sides have some form of mutual obligation. God's obligation here is to lead and to guide and to protect and to bless and to deliver this land to Abram's descendants. Abram's half of the deal is to be faithful and obedient to God. This is really, we don't see the language of it here, but this is really the beginning of this idea in which Abram promises to follow God and God promises to be his God. God is doing something great here. And he signifies that through this weird ceremony. In many ways, the ceremony actually is so commonplace that it shapes the language. In your Bible, you probably read there in verse 18, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. But literally, it means the the words there are the Lord cut a covenant. This ancient Near Eastern tradition was so significant and so common and so part of the everyday experience that it has even shaped the language itself here that's used to describe it. It may be a strange way to make a covenant, to seal an agreement, to demonstrate the faithfulness of God. But it wasn't for Abram. And in God telling Abram to carry out this ritual, it wasn't an example of the faithlessness of Abram but rather a reminder of the faithfulness of God. And so as chapter 15 comes to a close, we're reminded of a couple of big things for us, I think, from the story of Abram. 
One is that we must be patient with blessing. Abram was beginning to wonder where God was. God had made a promise to him. And he was beginning to feel like Abram was never going to that God was never going to fulfill that promise to Abram, that Abram was never going to have a child or a descendant. He was going to be forced to leave all that he had to a slave. But God wasn't done working in the life of Abram. We too go through those seasons of life. Let me tell you, I've been there. And in many regards, I feel like I still am confident that God is doing something, but wondering when He's going to do it. It can be easy for us to ask God, how long? How many times do I have to get passed up for that opportunity? How many times, God, do I have to ask you only to see nothing change? But the same God who was faithful to Abraham will be faithful to us because God was indeed faithful. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we'll see that that 400, well, in Exodus, we'll see that, that 400 years is over and they begin to be led toward the wilderness. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we'll look out from the top of the mountain and Moses will see all the land that God has promised and God will tell him that He's ready to give it to them. Under the leadership of Joshua, God will give the land to them. And some 4,000 years after that, here we are. Today, celebrating an event that happened 2,000 years ago in the resurrection of Jesus. Anxiously looking for and awaiting our own resurrection, the coming again of Christ, knowing that God is still faithful and still working and still doing. This text in Genesis 15, however, also reminds us of the importance of faithfulness. Going back to our bank metaphor, we are all incapable of making ourselves righteous. We're in the red, and the only one who can get our account back in the black is God. But luckily for us, we serve a God who is gracious and merciful. And when we are faithful to Him, God counts it to us as righteousness. In the midst of those times of doubt and wonder, May we be a people who, like Abram, believe, fully, truly, and deeply believe in God, that the Lord may count it to us as righteousness.